Now we're turning to music. Now, modern composers have begun to abandon homophony at this point, especially in rhythmic beat. So we're moving from the neoclassical, where we see this use of constant use of harmony, especially in orchestral works, and instead they're going to be moving away from that. Uh, they're going to move to complex rhythms in which determining beat or meter can become very difficult. And this will make things very difficult for the listener because we like predictable music. We like to know where the beat, the meter, the rhythm fall in a song. We like it to be predictable. Those are the songs that we tend to hum along with. So the focus here is moving towards dissonance in harmony rather than a good constant rev uh, resolution. Basically, they're trying to break up what we would think of as harmony, create something different. They're trying to strip away a lot of those rules that we developed in the Baroque and the Neoclassical and see what happens when we start breaking them. They're also going to reject holding a single note throughout the piece, so the piece will modulate all over the scale. Instead, they try to use all keys equally. One of the best examples of this will be a Russian by the name of Igor Stravinsky, and he's a non-traditionalist. Uh, he's a Russian writing scores for ballet, and he will write the Rite of Spring, which will be a problem. In fact, right now, go over to D2L, and under this lecture and the PowerPoints is a link to the orchestral part of the Rite of Spring. I want you to listen to a good solid five minutes of it. And then once you really want to tear your hair out, come on back. Yeah, no, seriously, go to the link. It's, it's right over there. It's in that last tab. It's probably to the left. Yeah, yep, that one. Okay, I'll wait. So the Rite of Spring is actually a ballet, or at least a dance, associated with this music, which you just heard. And we don't know anything about the dance, about what happened. There's some very broad descriptions, but we're not really sure. We do know what happened with the music and what happened the first time it was played in Paris. The first time this, saw, this piece, uh, The Rite of Spring, is played in Paris, there is an actual riot. The music drives people to actually start assaulting one another. What you end up with is the audience breaks into two teams. One really wants this to end. Uh, it's too much dissonance. It's really bothering them. It's a huge problem. The other side actually wants to hear the rest of the piece. So they're fighting amongst themselves, and then the group that wants it to end is actually throwing items into the orchestra pit and up onto stage. And this is all going on. We have police called. There's uh, stories of ambulances and policemen being assaulted and everything else, but it was a huge mess. So 18 months later, the city of Paris again will host Stravinsky and his Rite of Spring. And, you would, and they're prepared this time. Uh, they've got police in the auditorium. They've got police outside. They've got everything set. They know uh, they're, they're prepared for the worst riot. They're prepared for a worse riot than what happens the first time. And of course, what happens the second time? Nothing. And this is funny because it's sort of in a metaphorical situation where you see something happen organically and it's beautiful and it's amazing and then you make it happen a second time and we're always sitting there a little disappointed wondering why why isn't it working quite as well but of course everyone expected it at this point everyone expected a riot and so everyone's disappointed when it doesn't happen but it can't happen the second time because you're expecting it you're looking for it Whereas the first time, no one was expecting any of this. So it develops organically. It becomes more dangerous. Then we have Gershwin, who is pretty much the opposite of our friend Stravinsky. He wrote music to be popular, meant to be popular with the public, uh, for musicals as well as movies. 
He also tries to write music that will play well in the music hall as well as the concert hall. So something that your average person, your average working class person will enjoy, may even want to go and hear just as much as the upper class might. And he's still popular today. He, of course, writes Rhapsody in Blue. And if you go over to D2L right now, under the Rites of Spring, there should be a link there for Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. And it always reminds me of United Airlines. It's because they used it for a commercial in the 80s. But, wow, that connection is strong. So the reason Rhapsody in Blue is so popular is, first of all, it's written for a piano. And most people in the middle class, upper class, etc. are going to have pianos. Uh, obviously, the working, working class and the poor do not. The music is simple and easy to follow. It's very predictable. You know what's coming up. And we love that predictability as humans. It also has a very simple melody, one that if you hear it just once, you will probably hum for the next 20 minutes. Or you could. So we see this vast differentiation between Stravinsky trying to break the rules, we see a lot of dissonance, and Gershwin, who's trying to simplify things and create a universally beautiful song. And this sort of back and forth between artistic movements and artistic ideas, that's going to continue. That's going to be very common as we move into the 20th century.